to get started with a press conference featuring Mayor Michael Hancock. Um, behind us, we also have Eric Haraga, our Executive Director of Economic Development, Ginger White, Executive Director of Arts and Venues, and Brendan Hanlon, our Chief Financial Oper Officer for the City of Denver. Thank you all again for being here. We wanted to provide an update as we committed to earlier this week with regards to some of the steps that the city will be taking with regards to the economic uh, sustainability and recovery of the city. As you are aware, the measures that have been taken by all levels of government over the past several days and weeks to reduce the spread of COVID-19 virus in our community has had a major impact on our business, businesses and our workers. Uh, this has been a hard time for small businesses in Denver and their employees, especially restaurants, bars, mom and pop shops, and so many others. The effects of all this have weighed heavily on me over the last several days. And we are acutely aware that it's going to be a long road to recovery. But we have a team of folks here and, and partner agencies and businesses throughout the city who are working to ensure everyone is cared for. Whether it's lining up volunteers to support our residents who cannot leave their homes and need medical delivery, excuse me, meal delivery, to standing up warming centers during the snowstorm for our residents experiencing homelessness and actively supporting our activation industry, our aviation industry, excuse me, working on federal action to support their people and relief uh, to our concessionaires. We're going to get through to the other side of this, and the city is committing to identifying, developing, and implementing local resources, whether financial or as wraparound services to support Denver business owners and their employees who have been affected. Our primary goal is to support the people directly affected by this, and we do this by supporting our businesses that, so that they can support their employees. Today, we're taking a step of creating an initial relief fund of $4 million to support small businesses during this time. As part of that, Denver Economic Development and Opportunity is setting up an emergency relief program to revise, provide cash grants up to $7,500 to qualifying small businesses. With highest priority of, uh, to those in the industries most impacted by the coronavirus pandemic, such as the food industry. DITO, in partnership with SEDS Finance, will also refocus their micro uh, loan program to support small businesses and their stabilization efforts. The city will be working in partnership with Mile High United Way and the Downtown Denver Partnership for distribution of the funds. The city and Downtown Denver Partnership will also work together on expanding the funding for small business relief and will be reaching out to the business community to amplify the impact of the small business support through donations. Is that me ringing? It might be, excuse me. Didn't realize it was on ring. That's my daughter. <laughs> In this effort, I wanna give a huge thank you to our members of city council who have been working with my administration to expedite the creation of this fund. We will also be taking several other steps to support our local businesses and workers. First, DDO will be working with the state and federal governments on next steps for our businesses to have ability uh, to have the ability to apply for Small Business Association's Economic Injury, injury Disaster Loan, which uh, could provide up to $2 million to businesses affected by the situation. And uh, we're also excited to hear that Colorado has been approved to be a part of that program and our businesses can start applying. We want to send a special thanks to Governor Jared Polis for his support and efforts around that uh, program. Current recipients of loans from DITO will have the ability to temporarily defer loan payments should they need to. Through the Imagine 2020 Artist Assistance Fund, Denver Arts and Venues will award grants up to $1,000 to individual artists who live in Denver, whose incomes are being adversely affected due to the cancellation of events, classes, performances, and other creative work. And if I can send a personal thank you to my wife, Mary Louise, who reminded me not to forget our artists who will be disproportionately impacted by our shutdowns. The Department of Finance will waive the 15% penalty for late payment of February and March sales, use and occupational privilege taxes due March 20th uh, and April 20th of uh, next month. The Department of Transportation Infrastructure will be suspending enforcement 
of the following. Parking meters, which will, allow, uh, uh, which will now be free and without time limits. Time limited, non-metered parking areas, residential permit parking areas, 72-hour parking limits, large vehicle parking, school bus loading zones, and, and booting uh, in the city of Denver. I want to thank all the people who have reached out to us on social media platform. Now, if you would, push it out and let, them, let everyone know that we've suspended enforcement of those, and that will help spread the word for us. And our workforce services have also transitioned to one-on-one support via email, phone, and online resources, and uh, stage a, a month-long virtual job fair where job seekers can access the same job opportunities they would be able to access if they were in person at job fairs. More information on all of these programs is available on the denvergov.org uh, website in the COVID-19 banner uh, there at the top of the page. Again, we ask you to go to denvergov.org uh, under the COVID-19 banner, which is at the top of the page. Listen, reason why we're stepping forward to share our, our thoughts and actions around this economic strategy or these economic strategies is that we recognize this is going to be a long haul, and we know it. Uh, these are our initial steps, and we're going to keep working. As I like to say, as we did with our housing efforts, we're going to remain in the laboratory to determine opportunities and, and, and remedies as we work to recover from these challenges. And so is the governor, who announced yesterday that the stay economic relief package is still in the works. And we'll continue to coordinate closely with Governor Polis on, this, uh, on these very important efforts, and we'll continue to work together. I know and believe in my heart we're going to get to the other side of this by working together, supporting one another. And that's why we remain focused. Again, our goal is to preserve people's jobs by supporting our businesses so that they can support their employees. Here's my appeal to all the people of Denver, is to remain calm, to remain patient, be generous with your time and your resources. Take the time to spend with your families, more time with your families. We ask you to donate blood as we're running a critical shortage within our blood banks. Take time to volunteer. If you live on a single family, uh, single family uh, residential block, walk down the street to a vulnerable resident, knock on the door to see what you can do to help them. And it might be something as simple as grabbing their prescription from the pharmacy, maybe run into the store, or as we deal with this snowstorm, maybe just plow on their sidewalk and their driveway without asking. But this is the time for us to appeal for calm. This is going to be a long journey. And we don't need um, to expend our, our energy um, to find ourselves in a place where we become lethargic and depressed. We need to focus on our mental health and our personal care at this time, as well as for those who are around us. But knock on the door of a friend, of a neighbor, call a relative, a mother, a father, an aunt, uncle, uh, someone who may need your help, and simply ask, how can I help? This is the time, as I said on Monday, for Denver to rise up and to meet these challenges. As a government unit, we're going to do everything we can to support our residents and to make sure that when we get to the other side of this, that together, we're stronger, and we recover together as one great city. We need your help right now, all Denver, and we just ask that you take your time, be patient, and be calm during these times. At this point, we're going to open it up for questions and answers. Mr. Mayor, can you hear me? This is uh, Joe St. George uh, here at the Fox 31 studios. We're live uh, across uh, Colorado right now. Um, you made some significant news today with student lo with loans um, in terms of economic relief, $4 million, up to $1,000 for artists. I want to ask you, Mayor, if I can, about the state of emergency or potential lockdowns. You've seen other major cities uh, issue uh, these uh, orders. Are you considering, do you have the authority right now to potentially issue a lockdown, a shelter in place? Thank you, Joe, uh, Joe uh, for the question. And uh, in case you didn't hear, Joe's question was about lockdown and uh, our shelter in place and whether or not I have the authority to issue such an order and if we're considering it. I got to tell you, Joe, as we enter into this response to this whole challenge, 
Um, I got to tell you that unlike any other disaster that we face in the city of Denver, we kind of have a sense of when a snowstorm hits as it is now, we can see it, we can smell it, we can feel it, we know it's happening, and we know that uh, it is brief in duration. Um, in this situation, we have a very uh, volatile, uh, uncertain, uh, complex, chaotic, and ambiguous situation. Um, and so we have to turn to an entire toolbox of potential remedies uh, and to help us respond. A, a shelter in place is part of that toolbox, and we only pull those out when we feel like we have enough justification to deploy them. Do I have the authority to enter a shelter in place order in the city of Denver? The answer to that question is yes. Um, but I tell you, it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to do that just as a city of Denver. As, as I participate in a conference call uh, earlier this week with, a, with about 53 mayors and city managers, we would prefer to have that happen as a region and at the, Sorry, at the very least as a region, but, at the, uh, but also as a uh, state. And so we have spoken to the governor, and I can tell you it's also part of his toolbox of, of uh, remedies or response in the event that we have to, to go that direction. But right now, uh, it's not something that uh, is immediately uh, being considered by the city of Denver. And if we do it, we will do it as a region and certainly prefer to do it as a state. Next question. Mayor Hancock, this is Lori Lizarrado with Nine News. Should Denver residents be preparing for a shelter in place order within the next 48 or 72 hours? You know, it's hard to call. I can tell you this, Lori. Um, and her question was Should the residents of Denver prepare for shelter in place? Um, I think we ought to prepare for the whole gamut of what could possibly happen. Though I, again, do not want people to panic. The reality is we got to we'll follow the guidance of uh, the CDC and the governor um, on this issue. And, um, you know, what we've learned about this situation is that things change by the minute and by the hour. And for me to sit here and say that it won't happen in 48 hours, I can't tell you that. What I can tell you is that when we, whatever we decide to do, we will have uh, sufficient justification for making that call. And we will try to do it as responsibly as possible for, for all the people of, the, of Denver, the metro region, and the state of Colorado. Mayor, Karen Morpho with CBS4 here. Do you have an idea what that might look like if it was a shelter-in-place order to be used? Well, the question is what it might look like. It'd give me more in terms of what you're trying to get to. What would that entail, a shelter-in-place order? What could some of the residents in Denver expect? Well, it would be, uh, I think, a clear order. Um, you know, if, if we, we issued a, a shelter in place, there would be some exceptions that would allow people to move about. Um, for example, going to the grocery store, um, a medical emergency, um, uh, you know, headed to the pharmacy, uh, for example. Those are just a couple of the, the, the reasons why you will be permitted to, to move about. But the goal would be, to ask all residents to comply with an order of sheltering in place um, so that we can, again, blunt the spread of the virus and flatten out our curve. Um, and then we would hopefully be responsible. Everyone would act responsibly uh, to stay indoors and to uh, not move about um, uh, unless absolutely have to do so. But it would be very clear uh, in the event that we have a shelter in place order. I'm looking around to see who else is. I see a couple of the, the emergency response folks. I can ask Bob McDonald to come up here. Uh, if you like, Bob, is there, is there anything else to add there? Okay. Come on up if there's something else you want to add there. Bob McDonald, our executive director of public health and environment, is here. Yeah, I just want to say that I think the mayor's spot on. Um, I think that the term shelter in place um, sometimes can cause panic. People think that they can't leave their house at all. Um, and, and we're having conversations about if we did have to go there, you know, it, it, it doesn't mean that, that people can't go outside and go for a walk. It doesn't mean that they couldn't go for a walk in the park. It doesn't mean they couldn't go for a hike. Um, they can go to a number of facilities that are necessary uh, for their own health and well-being. It doesn't mean that there's going to be a, a shortage of food. That there shouldn't be. If we have, if we're having those conversations, it doesn't mean that everybody in the next 48 hours should run out and 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 um, panic uh, by. 
uh, because the stores will stay open. The, the reason that you see empty shelves on stores is not because there's a short of, a, of food, it's because people can't stock it fast enough. So um, it, it certainly doesn't mean that everybody needs to stay in their home. There, there would be some clear guidance along those lines. Thank you. And I, let me just stress again. cities that have already done this for guidance on whether or not to issue a shelter-in-place order? Oh, absolutely. We've looked at other cities. We're studying what's going on across the country. Um, you know, and I think the only one up until the last time I was in a discussion on this, which was yesterday, uh, is the Bay Area, the, the five or eight counties in the Bay Area that came together and issued a shelter-in-place order. But I want to stress again what Bob laid out. It's, this, this is not a time for panic. I, you know, we can talk about a shelter-in-place order, which has, by the way, not happened. Um, uh, and, and there will be a lot that will have to go into discussion and efforts and planning to better educate the public about what will happen in the event that we had to go that direction. Uh, my point is this. This is a time for us to remain calm and not panic, not panic by, not panic in general. Uh, this is about all of our self-care and mental health. Um, and the more we can recognize that this is a journey that we're going to get through this, um, and the more we got to pace ourselves in terms of our energy and our anxiousness, uh, the better we're all going to be. And so uh, I cannot stress that enough. Just know it's part of the toolbox if we have to turn that direction, but we'll have plenty of justification to do it. Thank Mr. You, Mr. Mayor, does, does the city plan to... Mr. Mayor, one more question here from Fox 31. Um, are you planning on closing any other facilities? Is that being looked at, potentially nail salons or something along that nature? And also, earlier this week, you made a, a major point to say we had a PPE issue. We had some emergency gear issue, a ventilator, medical uh, supply issues. What is what are What have you done in the last few days to, to improve the shortage we have with gear for our emergency personnel? Thank you very much. So the order that the governor issued yesterday, uh, we are remaining aligned with the governor's order, which is now uh, 10 or less, uh, no more than 10 people gather in one location. Um, secondly, that we will include the salons and the, the uh, nail locations, hair, barbershops, beauty shops in that order as well. And so we are aligning ourselves with that order. In terms of the PPE equipment and our our other medical equipment necessary. We are still uh, in a moment in a sense of urgency. Um, I've had numerous phone calls with members of our delegation, uh, with the medical profession. Um, we have been focused on continuing to communicate to the federal government the needs that we have here, as I can tell you other governors and mayors are doing across the country. Um, but we've also um, begun by the, the, we've also created a process of prioritizing where that equipment will go uh, once it arrives. And so we have a strategy of of kind of the cascading of uh, recipients of that equipment as it arrives into our city. Mayor Tony Kovaleski with Denver 7. Hey, Tony. We've seen, obviously, the economic impact. The city is losing tax revenue from sporting events, from concert venues, from small businesses. You talked about cutting back today on the revenue that would come in from parking meters. How long can the city sustain this kind of economic condition? That's a great question, and I'm going to ask Brendan Hanlon, our chief financial officer, to come up. Uh, what I will just do a general override. Uh, we expect, as, as small businesses have had to expect uh, during this time, is going to be a tremendous impact to the city's uh, uh, economic uh, uh, strength, if you will. Um, but this is this moments like this we prepare for as a city, and, um, you know, we have been prudent uh, fiscally as a city. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we have uh, infinite resources. And uh, so I'll bring Brendan Hanlon up to talk a little bit about that. Good afternoon, Brendan Hanlon, Chief Financial Officer of the city. Uh, the mayor's absolutely right. These are circumstances that we try to plan for as part of the annual budget process each year. We make sure that we have sufficient reserves on hand to accommodate uh, unexpected revenue volatility. Uh, uh, of course, we're, we're monitoring sales and use tax and lodgers tax at this point in time, but I believe that we are well positioned with our reserves as well as uh, we've already asked agencies to begin s considering areas where they can cut back on spending so that way we preserve those reserves for as long as we need to go through this circumstance. Brandon, this is David Sachs with Denverite. Um, I'm wondering how you came up with that $4 million figure, if you could explain that. Um, I, I'm actually going to turn it over to Eric Haraga. I think he would be best to answer that question. Great. Eric Haraga, Executive Director, uh, Denver Economic Development and Opportunity. 
Thank you for the question. As we are looking at the businesses uh, in the program that we want to impact, uh, the number uh, between zero and 25 businesses is around 10,000. We're really looking to serve the most vulnerable businesses in our community. Uh, there are some guidelines under that, but uh, with the $4 million initially from the city funds, uh, we believe we could uh, serve 250 businesses. And as we are asking for the private sector for their assistance and their contribution, we expect that to ramp up. As the mayor said earlier, uh, this is just the first uh, of many programs that we'll be looking at. And in addition to this, uh, we'll see other programs from the state and the federal government, and we're collaborating with them. Uh, with this program, it was uh, a tool that was already existing. We have the infrastructure to execute microloans up to $50,000. Uh, we have uh, also existing program for the grant program up to $7,500. So we are just really feeding the infrastructure we already have and working with our partners at Downtown Denver Partnership. You know, let me just add some other things that we didn't mention as part of the, the script for this afternoon. And that is we, uh, three things. One, we have a couple corporate partners already uh, have shared with us that they're going to contribute to this effort to help support our small businesses, and we'll have that announcement in the coming days. Secondly, uh, we had a very good uh, substantive conversation with our bankers today, um, area bankers who uh, are working hard uh, within their regular, regulatory framework and have asked for the city support, which we are in position to do, uh, in terms of working with their regulators to release or to create a more flexible framework for them to defer um, some of the payments of loans uh, to some of the small businesses in the area up to 90 days. And that obviously will give our small businesses tremendous help and a boost. And so we want to encourage the regulators around our banks uh, to stand with our bankers who say we, we got to find a way to create a more robust and a more uh, uh, friendly regulatory system at this time uh, for, our, our bank, for our lenders. And then thirdly, we are working with the airport. The airport has already begun to work with airlines and other uh, stakeholders in their aviation enterprise, including concessionaires, uh, and beginning to change how they operate uh, or what the, come to some of the demands such as minimum guarantees uh, from the concessionaires and loosening those rules so that those concessionaires can get through uh, this period of time, uh, as well as restructuring some of the or deferring some of the landing fees and other costs related to the airlines. So there's a lot that's going on to try to keep the, the, the economy moving forward in the city of Denver. All, not, we can't talk about all of that here, but just to give you a sense that there's some other things happening uh, that uh, we hope to bring forward short, in short order. Other questions? Mayor, Mayor Tony Kovaleski, Denver 7 again. I wanted to ask you the immediate issue right now. We've got a blizzard that may be rolling in. Questions about homeless shelters, availability <clears throat> of beds. Do you plan on opening up? additional beds for the night and through tomorrow yes we we are and i'm going to ask britta fisher to come up our chief housing officer thanks for that question uh, i want to again thank our homeless service providers and shelter providers who have stepped up in this circumstance the snow is concerning and so today we opened up a warming shelter uh, for during the daytime use from 11 to 6 p.m at la alma lincoln park um, rec center so uh, that's receiving people today. Uh, we also will do that again tomorrow from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, we also have added capacity for overflow at St. Francis Center that will be open during those same hours uh, today and tomorrow. As far as available beds, uh, we have so far been able to accommodate folks, and we have our regular overflow and emergency uh, preparedness plan for accommodating anyone who chooses to come inside. So we encourage people to come inside and come to our shelters and we will uh, find places that we can accommodate them. Time Mr. for Mayor one more. Lori with Nine News again. Uh, we know the DPS is working on the potential for remote learning, potentially this school year. Is the city gonna do anything to help low-income families get access to remote learning? You know what, uh, we uh, have not uh, had the conversations internally, but obviously we will stand ready to be as uh, helpful as possible with families who don't have uh, access to computers and uh, internet. But I will also iterate the fact that Comcast has already moved to make Wi-Fi available to low-income families who do not have access to it now. And we have been partners with them in terms of 
uh, their uh, uh, Internet Essentials program, where we've helped to make uh, laptops and Internet available to low-income families. And so they have already moved to expand that, and we would turn to them as our partners to continue to do that, as well as partners like CenturyLink and AT&T as well. Okay. Mr. Mr. Mayor, one last one last question from us here as we're continuing our live coverage on Fox 31. Um, do you have any estimates of how many Denverites may have lost their job in the last few days? And yeah, what advice? What what do you tell them who they're sitting on their couch right now and they're they're looking at their paycheck and their pocketbook and they're wondering what's next? Well, first of all, we want them to know that their concerns and challenges are not far from our hearts here at the city and county of Denver, and that's why. We have a fully activated emergency operations center, and we're trying to pull every lever possible to provide uh, financial and support as well as to get a sense of when we might be able to, to end the shutdown. So with that said, um, that's what these partnerships are all about. We know that there are employers who are doing some phenomenal things out there in terms of even keeping people on payroll during the shutdown where their revenues have been disrupted. Um, but we're also encouraging the online workforce or, excuse me, job fair that's occurring uh, to reach out to our, our workforce department that has you know, employers who are looking for people who are, during this time, have a great deal of demand, quite frankly, and need employees, and we can help connect those individuals. Again, denvergov.org, uh, go to the COVID-19 tab, and you should see our workforce efforts there. If not, go to our Economic Development Opportunity webpage, and you'll find workforce there. Uh, but the reality is that's what these economic strategies are about, that the governor is laying out, that we're laying out, how can we provide interim support to businesses as best we can uh, to keep people employed, maybe support some of those dollars going to employees or people who've been laid off. And then secondly, uh, pushing at the federal level, making sure that they hear us loud and clear from the local municipal levels that those bills that are in Congress need to get passed and we need to get checks to people as soon as possible. Mayor Thank Tony Popolesky again, Denver State. Tony, I think this would be our fourth question. On the state of Denver Health. And we heard from the president today that the hospital association is calling for more equipment, concerns from hospitals around the country. What are the greatest needs for Denver Health, and what is the situation as far as bed space and availability as we talk today? You know what? Uh, only Denver Health can do a better job of telling you about the bed space, but I don't think their equipment challenges have changed or any different than the ones that we've been outlining, laying out here. PPE, personal protective equipment is critical. These are the gowns, these are the gloves, these are the masks that our first responders should be wearing, our volunteers should be wearing as they are helping people uh, come in, you know, seeking shelter from the weather, shelter uh, who may be experiencing homelessness, um, you know, our older adults who may need care. That equipment is critical. Ventilators, as we've been laying out, I mean, you're hearing that all over the country. Every governor I see on television, every mayor I see on television, all the interviews that I do, I'm talking about this PPE equipment that, quite frankly, is embarrassing. A nation of our standing has not a stash available to carry out and to get to states and municipalities at a time as critical as this. It is absolutely ridiculous. And uh, we, it, I can tell you again that we can set up um, alternative beds and housing for people experiencing homelessness in hotels as where as Britta and her team are working on leases. But if we don't have PPE for people who are volunteering in those sites, it will bring those opportunities to a screeching halt. It will bring first responders uh, and our efforts on the streets to protect and to take care of everyone's welfare to a screeching halt. Um, this, this, this is a cascading domino effect. If we don't get to the place where we're making sure that every state, every municipality has every tool necessary to respond responsibly to the people who are calling on us for services and help in our cities. Thank you all. We're done.